My name is Carrie Holmes, and this is the videotape sermon on Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 18, presented to Dr. Kevin King in partial fulfillment of the requirements for the completion of the course HOMI 501, preparation of the sermon. This is the audience. Thank you guys for coming out and supporting me in this assignment. And I pray something that's said or done tonight will change your life, that it will encourage you, that you will hear the voice of God as it applies to your life this evening. I'm going to start with the word of prayer. Can you guys pray with me and for me? Amen. As far as Father, we thank you once again, Lord, for waking us up this morning, God. We thank you for life, health, and strength, Lord. I thank you for this opportunity, God, to even minister your word to your people, oh God. I ask that you would hide me behind your course, that you would allow me to decrease, and that you would increase in me, oh God, that you would be my mouth, oh God, that your words would be evident, none of mine, oh God. I ask that you would even have your way, even in the midst of this assignment, that you would bind up all fear and anxiety, and that your Holy Spirit will be able to have free course in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So my sermon text will be coming from Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 8, if we can get our Bibles and turn there. So the scripture reads on this wise. But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened to me have fallen out rather to the furtherance of the gospel, so that in my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all the other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident in my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word of Christ without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy, and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. We know that the word of the Lord is already blessed. My topic tonight is going to be because God has a plan. And if I had to use for a subtitle, it would be, I will rejoice. So because God has a plan, I can and I'm able and I will rejoice. How many of you believe that God has an assignment that he's placed over your life? Amen. Just raise your hand. I know I believe it. So if you believe that, you can probably attest to the fact that there are many challenges that come with ministry. It's not always going to be easy. You're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. You're going to have times when you feel like it, times when you're not. The Lord's going to send you places, and you're going to say, what, Lord? I'm not going there. But you know that in your obedience to what the Lord is telling you to do, that it's all going to work out first for your good and then second for his glory. When you think on those things and you recognize the assignment on your life, it becomes easier to, to fully submit to that. But we often know that's always going to be a constant challenge because our flesh wants to do one thing, but our will wants to please the Lord and to do another thing. And tonight, this sermon basically is a method to encourage you that in whatever plan God has for your life, he's going to be able to carry you through. And because he's going to carry you through it, you can and should rejoice. I know that I found myself in situations where I thought the outcome would turn out poorly, or I found myself in places that was very uncomfortable, and then when I look back on it, I recognized that God's hand was present, that he had been orchestrating it the whole time. And today we're going to look at a particular passage of scripture that it exhibits and it highlights all of these concepts through the life and through events that the Apostle Paul has encountered. 
But before we can go all the way deep into the message, we're just going to take a closer look at who Paul was before he became an apostle and how those events ultimately led up to where he became and the great apostle and evangelist that he became. So we know that Paul was actually born Saul of Tarsus and that he was one of the leading persecutors of the Christians. And upon hearing that, I can only imagine, you know, how did Paul, who dedicated his life to killing anyone who professed that Jesus was the Messiah, turn out to be the evangelist, the apostle, the missionary that would then proclaim the gospel in such a dynamic way? And the answer was simply because God had a plan the whole time. And one day Saul would find himself traveling on the road to Damascus and he would have an encounter with God that would change his life forever. And we know that then his name then becomes Paul. So his name is changed from Saul and then it becomes Paul. We later find that Paul becomes one of the greatest apostles that ever lived and he assisted in planting many churches that we read about today. And one of the churches that Paul planted was the church at Philippi. And thus we find ourselves here today in our text, which comes from the epistle or the letter of Paul to the Philippians. And that's going to be in the first chapter. And our verses for consideration are the 12th verse and to the 18th verse. And we know that Paul writes his um, letter to the epistle, this particular one, in 62 AD during his first imprisonment in Rome. And this passage of scripture is significant um, to our lives as believers for many reasons. And as we take a closer look at the text, we need to understand that it was common when missionaries and apostles and people like Paul who traveled abroad to spread the gospel that they wouldn't return home. So Paul understood that this journey could indeed be his last journey. And so he wrote to the church at the um, Philippians to encourage them and to instruct them that they need not worry about his imprisonment and the things that he would have to endure. In verses 12 to 14, we see that Paul is giving a message to the church that everything that's happened up until that particular point in his life led to the furtherance of the gospel. It led to the advancement of the gospel. It led to people finding out a little bit more about who Jesus was. This brings us to our first point that because God has a plan in our lives, that whatever situation that should have been a binding situation can be turned around and changed into a platform for God's message to be revealed. Verses 12 to 14 reads, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that I have become evident to the whole palace guard and to all of the rest that my chains are in Christ and most of the brethren in the Lord have become confident by my change and are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Here Paul is sharing with the Philippians that because of his imprisonment and his very presence, the people who were surrounded by him had a chance to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we look at the text deductively, we note that Paul had an opportunity to minister to people around him. We see that Paul had a chance to spread the gospel even to the whole Roman soldiers which made up the palace guard. And that because of what was happening in Paul's life, other people who were ministering the gospel gained a sense of boldness and fear was then decreased. So when you think about the situations, you see Paul is locked up and he's in jail. And you might wonder, well, how in the world can Paul be ministering to people and he's locked up? But we have to look that there was something different about Paul's imprisonment. And it was something that was strategic and that God was already working in the midst of the situation. Now, when we think about jail, we envision a small cell or being behind bars or being locked up with chains. However, Paul's imprisonment was different. He was in what we know as today as house arrest. And because he was in house arrest, that was one of the primary reasons that he was able to minister to the Roman soldiers that were the palace guard. And another key fact was that Paul was able to receive visitors at the location of his arrest. And this is likely another platform that Paul used to minister to people and was made aware of the testimonies of people that he had encouraged other believers to speak boldly about Christ. 
Now, many of us, or at least people like me, would have been upset in the conditions that they were in or upset in the circumstances that they were facing. We would have been questioning God, God, why you sent me to this land and I'm locked up, I'm in captivity, I don't know what else to do, I was being obedient to what you told me to do. And all that shows is our limitations as human beings. But Paul trusted God and he was content in whatever state he was in as we also as he also made reference in Philippians 4 and 11 and because he recognized that there was a bigger picture at hand and that there was a greater work being performed in the midst of his bondage and his captivity he was able to recognize that that was just another opportunity he could use to reflect Christ and to spread the gospel now we look at verses 8 15 to 18 and they read some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for such a time as this for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I in this I rejoice, yea, I will rejoice. When we look at these particular verses, Paul is expressing to the Philippians that while many have been encouraged to speak boldly the word of Christ, there were many that were preaching out of impure motives. There are people preaching out of jealousy, out of envy, out of strife, or just because they saw it as a platform, they recognized that Paul was no longer on the scene and that he was locked up, so they saw that as their next biggest opportunity to become the next biggest thing or the next biggest preacher or apostle. And many of us that are in ministry, we can identify with that. There's always those people that are just waiting for you to fall so they can have an opportunity to take your place. There's people who, you know, they're waiting for you to get a cold or strep throat so that they can lead praise and worship in your place or somebody who's just hoping that you fall and break your foot so that they can dance or somebody that's just hoping that you make it to church late so that they can pray and lead intercessory prayer in your place. But Paul's example instructs us and the leaders and the members of the church that we need to stay humble even in the midst of those type of circumstances and those type of people that we still need to trust God. He encourages us not to focus on those type of people and what's going on around us, but to keep our focus at ministry. And this brings us, you know, to our, our second point, that because God has a plan, nothing else matters. Paul states, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. What he's saying here, it may be simple or easy for us to understand, but the key is that if we're going to carry out our assignment that God has given to us, that we need to stay focused. We need to realize that nothing can happen without God's permission. Sometimes we're going to go through things that are going to be uncomfortable, and we're going to meet people who are going to try to tear us down, but it's all because God has a plan, and he has a purpose, and because he's building, and he's shaping, and he's molding us. Paul reminds us that we don't have to be concerned about the little things that's going on around us, but rather, or the things that's trying to discourage us, but rather keep our focus on the fact that the message is still being told and that people are having a chance to hear about the redeeming power of Jesus Christ and that our assignments are still being fulfilled. This brings us to our last point. Because God has a plan, we can rejoice and his plan will work. The passage concludes with Paul stating in verse 18, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is still preached. And in this, I have a reason to rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. Now, this is probably the most important um, message in this sermon. Paul demonstrates unconditional joy. He demonstrates that regardless of his circumstances, he can rejoice in the fact that God is real, that God is with him, and that God's plan has been in action the whole time. One can also infer from this account of Paul that he has learned to trust God and have total faith in God. And once you can do that, and you can trust God and have total faith in God and complete 
trust that he's going to bring, he's going to carry out his plan and carry out his will, then you can too rejoice no matter what circumstances you might be in. Now, after hearing this message, you may acknowledge some situations that are present in your own life where you've been uncomfortable, it's been unbearable, and you may be saying to me, you know, I didn't keep the right attitude, I didn't use it as an opportunity to minister, I didn't glorify God. You know, the great thing about Christ is that he continually gives us chance after chance after chance, and he gives us his word as an example to correct, to rebuke, to change us, and to make sure that we have better lives. It's not too late, and you can change today. Or on the flip side, you may be the person who has been pressing your way, working diligently in ministry, but sometimes you find yourself in a place of weariness. And I encourage you all to remember Paul's example and apply these basic principles to your own life. Remember that God has a plan, and because he has a plan, situations can be turned around. You don't have to focus on the negative that's around you, and you can rejoice no matter what state you're in. As the scripture says in Nehemiah 8 and 10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. You were not just here by happenstance or to just witness me recording this sermon for a class, but I believe that everybody that's here is here today because the Lord has something that he wanted to say to you concerning your own life and for your own ministry. And if we can, I just want to pray for you. We bow our heads in prayer. Amen. Lord, we come before you today just to say thank you, Lord. God, we thank you for your word that was accomplished that has accomplished what it was set out to do. Lord, we thank you for every listener that's under the sound of my voice, that they have taken something from this message, that they have found themselves in the scripture, and that they have seen you evident in their life, and that whatever the circumstances are, whatever the situations are, Lord, that they're going to become encouraged, they're going to become motivated, that they're going to become diligent in what you've called them to do, whereas that they can see how you're working in their life and that they can look at each situation and face it head on, recognizing that you have a plan, that they can rejoice no matter what's happening because they know that you're going to bring them through it, God. I ask that you just have your way in each and every one of their lives, oh God. And those who have been working diligently in ministry, Lord, I ask that you would strengthen them, oh God, that you would encourage them, oh God, that you would give them that extra push that they need, that they can continue to carry on the work that you've called them to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Now, you may be here today or you may be watching this video and you've not given your life to Christ at all. You may find yourself in stressful situations. You find yourself in bitterness and negativity and unhappiness. And you may be saying to yourself that I want to know this God that everybody's talking about. I want to know this God that can take something bad and turn it around for good. I want to know this God who can change my life, that he can get the glory out of it. And if you are that person today and you want to find joy in the midst of your persecution and your transgression, then I encourage you to pray this prayer with me. Lord, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner and I come before you today asking that you would change me. Lord, I ask you for your forgiveness and I recognize that I cannot live this life without you any longer. I confess and I believe in my heart that you are Lord of all and that you died on the cross for me so that I might be saved. I pray, Lord, that you would save me. I accept you into my heart. I accept you into my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you all for your presence and I hope that you are blessed. Amen.